Good morning. You know, I'm always fascinated when I come to this. I just left, by the way, talking to the firsties. I'm going to talk to each class in turn today. Firsties and the plebes, they're the easy ones, okay? Because you got one there kind of on their way out the door, and the other one is a very captive audience. It's those interior classes that are going to be exciting today. I'm very happy to be here. Welcome to the second largest theater in the East Coast, 4,300 seats. And these are new seats. And thanks to you for that, because it is a function in large measure of the margin of excellence, which I have begun to believe in, that does make a difference here at West Point, especially given our declining fiscal resources, more about which later. Welcome back to West Point. I really mean that. We are so pleased to host all of you from around the United States here at your alma mater. And I had such a great feeling last night over in Herbert Hall about the spirit of affiliation that is so critical to this unique United States Military Academy. Thank you so much for what you do each and every day for West Point. We need you. And uh, in a minute, I'm going to talk to you a little about uh, what things that we will ask you to do for us as you go back to your chapters and your local tribes. Okay? Very, very important that you represent this vital connection between West Point, our graduates in the field, who are so critical to us increasingly in terms of their time and talent and treasure. So welcome to West Point. So many things I want to tell you about today. I've got just a couple slides. We won't overwhelm you. Uh, but I do want to tell you about some of the things that are taking place here. I know you had a great session with some of our new brigade leaders yesterday. Charlie Phelps, our new brigade first captain, a terrific natural leader, a great youngster who is uh, just now taking on the mantle of responsibility. And yesterday morning, we got up about 4.30, went over to the MacArthur Statue at 5, did the first brigade run. Of course, we had the march back. How many of you did the march back? I can see some of you. Thank you so much. We had 180 plus this year, highest number, I think, in the history of the 12 years of the march back. Thank you for doing that. I encourage the rest of you to get on that elliptical and join us next year, okay? It's a great event. We had spectacular weather. Thanks so much for doing that. So we had our brigade run yesterday. Charlie Phelps and I uh, did our 3.4 mile with the other 4,700 members of the United States Corps Cadets. And you know, when we do these things during reorganization week, we rediscover some of the tenets of the, uh, the laws of physics. So what am I talking about? It's a very interesting dynamic in this generation that in addition to doing standard army cadences, we like to sing, okay? So, you know, I'm making my way up one of these godforsaken hills thinking, come on, Charlie, easy. So, and he's not quite yet, I think, discerned that if you have 4,700 human beings behind you, there is the capacity for the line to extend. And so what really makes the difference, as I think so many of you may recall from your youth, is that if you do cadences, then you're pretty much moving in the same operational tempo. But if you sing songs, something very different happens, okay? So for some reason, Charlie and his team of merry men and women at the very front there, filled with the great joy of being the new leaders of West Point, decided they would sing our favorite songs from Top Gun, okay? Which was great. They don't have a lot of, you know, uh, talent when it comes to their singing voice, but it was an enthusiastic rendition. But something very interesting happened that Charlie saw at the end of the run. What do you think that was? We had the great accordion, okay? So the first four companies of the United States Corps Cadets looked magnificent as they crossed in front of us standing at Pershing Barracks, built in 1895. And yet, after that, what should have been a very disciplined formation looked a lot more like a Roman circus, okay? And that's okay. That's what Charlie is beginning to put his arms around, this great joy of being the leader of the United States Corps Cadets, but at the same time, there is accountability, right, Doug? Yes. So this is the grand lesson of leadership, once again renewed at West Point. So some things don't change, okay? And that's a good thing. Bill MacArthur and I had a wonderful opportunity two nights ago to travel across time as we marched through the barracks, about 2100, just to kind of see how the 
new class was dealing with the plebes during reorganization week. Some of you may remember that uh, the plebes are happy to be back, but there is a sense of petite malaise on the part of the other classes as they return from overseas. And not all of them are, are willing yet to embrace the goodness of the freshman class. So I wanted to make sure that perhaps through my presence I could kind of keep them moving in the right direction. And it was fascinating because as we moved from barracks to barracks, we saw in large measure a 21st century polished professional approach, all in consonance with Schofield's definition of discipline, which I love. And if you haven't read it, go back and read it. The words still mean something. I quoted it this morning when I talked to the firsties, and I will all through the day. But there was a moment when Bill and I looked in the direction of what's now called Sherman Barracks. Some of you may recall it as Old South, where we still have those wonderful 19th century facades, the stoops. And there I saw in front of me at about 2115 a company of the United States Military Academy, and they were marching in a circle, okay, about 2115. I'm looking at my watch thinking, we're going to get up in about six and a half hours to do a five mile plus uh, brigade run. What is going on? So uh, I went over there and in my most professional voice, trying not to embarrass anyone, simply asked the company commander, could you tell me what's going on here? And his response was, the new cadets, the new cadets this afternoon had not yet mastered drill and ceremony and they needed some additional attention. You know, I felt like I was going back into the 19th century, that Sylvanus Thayer was going to pop out of the bushes at any moment in time and uh, we'd be back to the fair system. But um, I went under the stoops, I was watching some other new cadets who were in the business of the classic traditional trash detail, okay? Also at about 2115, asked them the same question, how long is it gonna take? We think it's gonna take another 30 minutes, sir. Who's in charge? Silence, okay? But we got that one under control and as it went back out into the area in front of Sherman Old South, the company that had been marching was nowhere to be found, okay? So, progress, okay? All right, all right, let's get to uh, what we're all about here. We need you, we're very happy to have you, we need you to go back to your post camps and stations, to your communities, to tell the story of West Point. I just wanna give you a quick update on some things that are happening here, and just ask you to take back the story of West Point. That's what you can do for us. And I would tell you that West Point is in the middle of what I would describe as a critical transition in its history as we face increasing fiduciary pressures. If the Department of Defense is about to face a fairly significant cut in the next decade, what are the numbers? Anybody recall the numbers based on the debt ceiling crisis? Jeff, what do you think they are? Give me a ballpark figure. Yeah, absolutely. 350 for sure billion, and then perhaps 550 billion cut from the Department of Defense. That will make its way up the Hudson River, I assure you. And uh, we are beginning to see some of that already in some of the constraints that we have and some of the layoffs that we're going to have to have here among our civilian team literally in the next year. So we're going to tighten our belts as so many of you know in the remarks that I've made to many of you at Founders Days, and we're going to be okay, but the larger responsibility that all of us has is to tell the story of West Point, because in an era of declining fiscal resources, and gosh knows we've seen this so many times, what we all must do is to speak in the most eloquent manner about the real value and meaning of West Point, because those questions will be asked why West Point? Why the cost? What's the purpose? We're out of those two big campaigns. What's going on here? And we have a great answer. There is a magnificent story here at the United States Military Academy, but we need all of you collectively to help us to tell that story. And we'll help you with the information, I assure you. And I know the Association of Graduates will do so. Let's go to the next slide. And I always start with the mission of the United States Military Academy. Always regardless of my audience. And I know that you know this mission, but here's a start point in telling the story of West Point. There it is, our commitment to the values of duty on our country. And the second part, the second part that the first class, the class of 2012, is beginning to 
pay closer attention to, and that's their very near future to serve as leaders of character for the sons and daughters of America who are now serving in uniform in a time of war. This is our raison d'etre. This is our reason for being. That's our mission. This is the beginning and the end of everything that we do here at West Point. It is our connection to our army and to our nation. And this one is inviolable. And this one will not change. Next. I want you to embrace, because these are your priorities, perhaps misnamed as the superintendent's priorities, always begins with our focus on the United States Corps of Cadets. And let me give you a little subtext for that, because I know that we've talked to so many of you at Founders Days and other events about military construction. When I got here a year ago, people said to me, what's the biggest surprise you've had since the time when you were a cadet? And the answer to me was, the barracks look very familiar. Okay? And that wasn't a happy thing to say. I, I'm still astonished every time I go over there about the absence of HVAC, of the right control systems, of the overcrowding. And we have 40% overcrowding here at West Point, three and two man rooms. Now you're going to say, well, I live through that. It's no big deal, General. Well, actually, there are second and third order effects attended to that kind of overcrowding. And if we're going to sustain the commitment to excellence that West Point must have, its capacity to innovate and to be adaptive, then we must also, in our first priority to the United States Corps of Cadets, provide them with the quality of life that the rest of the Army has had now for two decades. And we're going to do that. We've been knocking on the door this past year. I've used every iota of what residual political capital I had as the director of the Army staff to get the headquarters to finally put in the palm, and it is there now, the military construction dollars that we must have to build our first set of barracks since 1972, Bradley Barracks. By the way, the average age for barracks here at West Point is 83 years. That's all the barracks, 83 years old, okay? So we're going to build the first set of barracks starting next fall. Next fall, 2012, okay? And that's a pretty fast start. $131 million military construction project, and that's a lot of money. Not going to be phased, which was the original approach. We're just going to get after it. And then over the next four to six years, the United States Army will palm the major renovation and reconstruction of all of our other barracks. So we will get after this quality of life, and that's our most important priority to help the United States Corps Cadets. Other things we're doing. Ted Martin, our great new commandant, former CG of the United States Army Armored School and Center at Fort Benning, Georgia, is going to come talk to you a little later today. And he will address some other things, among which will be a movement in the direction of a mess hall schedule that we think will be better for the cohesion and bonding and teamwork of the United States Corps Cadets. Not to mention eliminate a lot of the waste we've had in the past many years. I'll let him get to that. All about the quality of life of your cadets. The connection to the United States Army, it's about parallel in my mind with the commitment to the United States Corps of Cadets. This is their future. And we don't waste time or miss a moment or an opportunity to remind our cadets, each class, that the ultimate outcome of their time here is not throwing that wonderful hat in the air in late May morning at Mikey Stadium, but rather their leadership responsibilities, their leadership responsibilities. And so the connection to the Army is critical. And with staff and faculty, we're doing all kinds of great research and support for the Chief and the Department of Defense writ large and lots of other things. There isn't a day or a week or a month that goes by here at West Point that we don't bring in a graduate, a recent graduate, from the campaigns in Iraq or Afghanistan or in some other place around the world to talk about what it is really like to lead soldiers in this time of war. That's our connection to the Army, and that's terribly important. That's their future. That's how we will measure the success of our graduates, by their performance as leaders of character wearing this uniform, and then subsequently in service to the nation. Connection to the Army. The rest of these, I think, are self-evident, but they are the priorities that I want all of you to 
be thinking about as people ask you about what's going on at West Point today. They are your priorities. They are the ones that I think collectively we can all embrace. I talk here about strategic communications and transparency because, as I mentioned before, we have got to tell the story of West Point. I think we're beginning to do that in some remarkable ways. I'll talk about uh, that a little later. Collaborations and partnerships are always a sign of a first-tier organization. We're trying to open the doors here at West Point to a lot of like-kind first-tier colleges and universities, other consortiums, and uh, to do some sharing of best practices that will continue to help us to grow and to be even better as a major institution. And then you can see the last couple that speak to leader development. Leader development, leader development of our staff and faculty, and then finally the business of the sustainment of excellence. We are so proud of what takes place here at West Point, but we must change. And change is not easy. Change is not easy, but we're doing the right things here, we think. Next. The class of 2015, I know Charlie Phelps, our great new first captain, talked a little about summer training, but I am very proud of this new plea class. By every metric, by every fundamental, substantive measure of effectiveness, this may be the finest class to enter the United States Military Academy. Look at that number of valedictorians. These are your varsity letter winners, your student class presidents. Their SAT and ACT scores are off the scale. They are terrific, and they came in as a grand class, and I can assure you, having been with them almost every day and night in the past six weeks, here at West Point or at Buckner and the other training ranges, that they have done well. They are resilient, they're tough, they are beginning to understand the mastery of field craft, beginning to understand it, and uh, they're beginning, beginning to understand very, very carefully clearly this year what it means to be a follower. And that's really what we're after in that first summer. We have the lowest attrition rate here in this class of any class in the past decade. And it's not because we were easy. The standards are high. This is a grand class and we are very, very proud of them. They're going to do wonderful. Class of 16, more applications already than last year for 15. And we had, as you can see, the better part of 14,000 applications to get here to West Point. What happens on reception day? Will they come in here a little apprehensive for some reason, accompanied by lots of parents who are even more apprehensive, and march them into this place right here in two locations, and we give them a quick opportunity, 90 seconds, as so many of you know, to say farewell to those families. That's an exciting moment, I can assure you. They go out this door, and they are immediately met by people who scowl at them, okay? but in a very professional way. And they begin their journey, their journey that includes the issue of some wonderful clothing, a terrific new haircut. We start to teach them how to turn left and right, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they burst out of the sally port and they march as a military formation across the plain. And they stand there and raise their right hand as the Commandant of Cadets tells them to state their full name, to speak about supporting and defending the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And they do this, these wonderful youngsters, with a full apprehension, I believe, that four years hence, they could very well be leading America's sons and daughters in harm's way. And I think that's a breathtaking message about their values. It's a grand day, and it was a grand day six weeks ago. Next. This is about the second thing that happens to them when they come here on reception day. They go into Fair Hall, and they go through all kinds of screening processes that are quite remarkable, and very professionally done and they pick up this card, and that's the beginning of their connection to the most important element here at West Point that still holds sway, that underwrites everything that we do here, and that is our honor code, and it is their system. And I'm very pleased in general with the way this is going, but I would tell you that this system always requires review and oversight. 
and we, we fall short sometimes. There is no question about it. But this commitment to honor begins on the first day, and it is one of the things that separates us. When you look at these remarkable lists of America's best colleges that cost X thousand dollars a year, here's something that truly separates us. This is the beginning of the creation of leaders of character. And we hammer this, we reinforce this, we reaffirm this each and every day. Thanks. Okay, how many of you come through Washington Gate, hard by the Silverman and the Ski Slope, and what do you see? Yes, I saw a hand back there. What do you see out there? The prep school. By law, it's here. We're happy it's here. It's going to work out great. We've done a very good job, I think, in planning the team here of making this thing happen. We're all good to go with the NCAA and all this other stuff. And we've got 240 great young men and women who are going to be this year's cadet candidates in order to come to us the following year to the United States Military Academy. Great youngsters. They're down the road. Terrific curriculum. The dean and the commandant are charged last year to take a new look at the curriculum of the United States Military Academy prep school. I have had some concern over the past year about academic performance. What we cannot have at this grand place, and this is a magnificent new facility, is attendance. We have to have achievement to get into West Point, and we are going to make sure that happens this year. Okay? But if you haven't seen it, please drive up to Washington Gate, pull the car over. This is a terrific facility. We're doing a very small amount of sharing in the cadet area this year across the street in some classrooms and math sciences, but by next year that will all be isolated in this location. Wonderful commandant, Colonel Ty Gregenstein, who brought the team up from Fort Monmouth. And we are off and running. We are off and running. Great youngsters, great future. Here's something else that happened this year since we're talking about news at West Point. How many of you as uh, cadets in a previous century were in I companies? Anybody here? Okay. The I companies are back. Okay. We went from 32 to 36 companies. Why did we do that? Because we wanted the opportunity to improve the span of control of our tactical officers and tactical NCOs with large companies. When you have 32 and you have 4,700 cadets, you, you can't do all the things you must do as a leader. And so we've increased the quality of leader development. We've given more cadets a chance to be leaders and it's going to be just great. So if you see smaller formations, perhaps, at the parade on Saturday, take part. My companies are back, and that's a good thing for West Point. Next. Okay. One of the things we're going to ask all of you to participate in in the next couple of months, because collectively this is about your contribution, your affiliation with West Point, is we are looking at a new leader development system here. Now, for a couple of years, we've had what's called the Cadet Leader Development System at West Point. Very internally focused kind of things that cadets should be, know, and do. We've taken a hard look at that. We want the West Point community writ large, cadets, staff and faculty, the garrison, anybody who has an affiliation with West Point, certainly our graduates, to be able to stand up if someone says, if leadership is everything that we do at West Point, what does that really mean? And we begin by looking at outcomes. So this is what a West Point graduate should be. And we're going to take time in the next couple months to get this one refined and polished so that all of us, all of us in this group and in your societies, and certainly our cadets can stand up and say, a West Point graduate should be this and that. And this should be the outcome of this 47-month experience. So I would ask you to participate in this. We'll be in comms with you about how to do it. But look at the first and the last bullets there. They talk to leadership, and they talk to our code of honor. The beginning and the end, leadership and integrity, leadership and integrity. And the rest of those things should look very familiar to you from your own experience in service to the nation and to the United States Army. We ask you to be a part of this project leader development. It's the heart of what we do so well for our nation here at West Point. Next. Okay. Uh, look, I'm not going to hang on this one. It made me smile for just a couple seconds. 
But I want to tell you that uh, there's two things to remember here. You know that, uh, and this is a, a listing of over 600 plus colleges in the United States of America, and by a pretty interesting set of criteria, West Point ranked third in the nation behind Williams and Princeton, both schools which will charge you very happily $55,000 a year to take tuition for their youngsters, okay? We have a little better scale here, okay? So we're real pleased with this. It's nice to have a positive trend. We went all the way from four to three. Okay, I can stay another week. <laughs> the other categories that I thought were intriguing were third in the nation in the quality of medical care for students. And that's a great tribute to the team at the Keller Army Community Hospital. Magnificent team there. And do we have the greatest orthopedic center in the world? Yes, and why is that? because we get a lot of practice, okay? <laughs> and what's the other category? Two other categories I found interesting. One is we came in third in the nation in terms of the quality of our athletic facilities, and that's a grand story about the physical domain here and the quality of our athletic teams, the raw material that's shaped so tremendously here. What happened to our rugby team last year? Men took fourth, women did what? National champions, national champions, a club sport. And what's the percentage of women and men coming to West Point who played rugby before they came here? 15%, almost nothing. 85% of them learn that sport here. National champions, pretty spectacular. When you set the mark here at West Point, your cadets will exceed the mark. So third in the nation in terms of athletic facilities. And the last category that I found fascinating was we came in in the top five in the category Cold Stone and Sober Schools, okay? And, and I was wondering, why, right, why were we only fifth, okay? This gave me a moment of pause. Look, here's what I like about this slide. <clears throat> Look on the, the left side there. So here's the opening page for this article in Forbes. This is past, past week. And what's on the left? We set that advertisement. Okay, there's a great message. Talk about it. great position. There's West Point being advertised, right arrayed against the Forbes Annual Review of the best colleges in the United States. We came in third this year, which is okay. We don't rest our laurels on that. We're about leadership. We're about the future. We're about the connection to the Army. This is nice. It's great to have the advertisement there, too. And that's a message about how important our strategic communications effort must be here. Every month we place an advertisement like this, high quality, in some major legitimate periodical around the United States. There's a payoff. Okay. Next. Okay. So many of you know, because I've talked to a lot of you before in this room, so many old friends in this audience, that this has been the traditional last slide of our briefings at West Point in the past many years. And this is the great moment that all of us remember. This is the moment in a late May morning, and it was spectacular this year with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, serving as our graduation speaker. The night before, the First Lady of the United States gave a remarkable talk to our graduating seniors in the mess hall. Someone who is very deeply committed to military families. So in this glorious moment, we throw those hats in the air with a sharp intake of breath, and we think about the 47 months, the compression of great memories, some not so great, the remembrance of the teams that we've built here, the friendships that will last us for a lifetime, the families that brought us to this remarkable place. And it is a grand image, but this is not the last slide. This is not the outcome of West Point. It's this next image. It's this next image which is all about West Point. That's the future. It won't matter where it is. This is a lieutenant perhaps in the Corongal Valley in charge of his soldiers or her soldiers. It won't matter where the President of the United States tells us to go, but West Point must always be ready to answer the call, to execute the mission the standard, to provide values-based leadership. That's our commitment collectively. That's what all of you We'll need to 
reaffirm and to tell your chapters, your societies, your tribes when you go home. That's our commitment to you. It's inviolable. And this is what we do for the United States of America. And I think to a very high standard. And thank you for what you do every day for West Point. Go Army.